listening to the Lutheran Ladies Lounge podcast. I'm Sarah. I'm Erin. And I'm Rachel. It is the Sarah Goes to School episode. I feel like I need theme music for this because I'm just... <laughs> <laughs> or at like least like a sound not- effect yeah, of yeah. a school bell. <laughs> <laughs> that would be fun. Maybe I'll maybe I'll put that in in post-production. Uh-huh. <laughs> Class is in the session. <laughs> That was perfect. Uh, that really actually. was. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is part two of Sarah Goes to School. Last time we did the whole like character model structure thing and, you know, relational nutrients and all of that really awesome stuff that I had a lot of fun telling you guys about. And today, this is kind of, we're, we're going to cover three things today because I've had a well, like, well, yeah, I've had like a class and a half since the last time we did this. And so there's a lot in my brain, but mm. we're going to do three things. They're super applicable to anybody. It doesn't matter what vocation you're in. For our guy listeners, if you're pastors, this is too, super applicable. If you're rocking it as a stay-at-home mom, if you're working in an office, it doesn't matter. This is all going to be applicable in some shape or form. So I should just rehash in case you missed the. If you're listening backwards, I will rehash what we're doing here. Yes, I was going to suggest that. I'm, I I know what we're doing here, but why are we going to school, Sarah? Where are we going to school? What are we studying? I mean, I'm a homeschool mom. This is what I do all day, but bring me up to speed. Okay, so I'm getting my master's in organizational leadership at Concordia University, Irvine Townsend Institute. And so I'm in my third class right now on teamwork, building effective teams, conflict resolution. That'll be the next time. So look forward Mm. to some great stuff next time. Well, and since I say this every time and I'm going to keep saying it, we are so proud of you for going out there and getting this degree, like continually proud. Thank you. Appreciate that. So I did my residency already. I did a class on leadership styles and a class on organizational culture. So that's what I've gotten under my belt already. And so this time today, we're going to talk about macro cultures, which makes me think of macaroni and cheese, but it's not food, unfortunately. That's our next Mm. episode. Macro cultures and then personal mission, vision and values. And then the big, like massive life changing thing for me anyway, because I am super conflict avoidant and just like never even try to have conflict with people, which I'm learning is not a great thing, is the eight step model for difficult conversations from Dr. John Townsend who started the Townsend Institute. So those are the three things we're covering today. First, macro cultures. Do you guys want to take a guess at what macro cultures means? I mean, macro is like big and overarching. I'm trying to imagine a macro culture because culture itself is usually uh, pretty enormous and overarching. Mm. So, okay, yeah. Yeah. It's like the opposite of micro. Uh (laughs) Yeah, yeah. So I can English. (laughs) So like cultures can kind of... I'm so confused though. Break it down for me. (laughs) Kind of like concentric circles. So, so we read like the book on organizational culture by Edward Edgar Schein. He's like the expert on organizational culture, and he his definition of culture is the pattern of basic assumptions invented, discovered, or developed by a given group as it learns. So there's three levels of a culture in general, and we'll get to macro cultures in a second. So in a culture, you've got artifacts, you've got espoused beliefs or values, and you have underlying assumptions. And so artifacts are the things that you can actually see and physically experience. So like for our Lutheran ladies, Aaron's face looks very... (laughs) <laughs> Deep in thought right now. So like, let's take our Lutheran ladies on Facebook group because that's that's going to be familiar for people, right? So artifacts would be like our yellow wallpaper, our pink couch, the rules that we have that we all abide by, those kinds of things. Like in an office building, it would be stuff like branding, clothing, the color of your cubicle, whether people have standing desks or sitting desks, the kind of decorations people have, that kind of stuff. Those are your artifacts. And then you have your espoused beliefs, which are the things that a company or even like a family unit says about itself. So these are the mission, vision, and value statements, your policies and procedures, those really fun things, how the company talks about itself in the media, that kind of stuff for the the things, how you talk about your own culture, the things that, that you know and that you say to other people. 
And then your underlying assumptions, this is this is where the meat of it is. So these are the things that are really at the core, the things that you have to deduce from what people say. So possibly things that you observe rather than what is actually stated about the company itself, if that makes sense. So this is how much you can push back in a meeting, how much conflict is actually accepted, regardless of how much people like if you ask somebody like, how much conflict can you actually have in a meeting? And they may, and somebody might say, oh, you know, we, we talk back and forth to each other. It's fine. But if you go and observe a meeting, maybe there's actually a lot of Midwest nice going on and nobody's actually talking back to each other because the underlying assumption is that you don't actually argue about anything. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So like other things would be like whether if you have a question, whether you call or email, that's just an understood thing in a company culture how formal relationships are between leadership and direct reports. So if I have a boss and then the boss above that, if I'm like two levels down, is it appropriate for me to go to that second layer of leadership or should I only go to my own boss? And those are things that may not even be talked about or explained, but it's the the things that you pick up on how people operate in the culture without actually saying what they are. And a lot of times it's things that people say that a culture or a relationship in a workplace or a family works a certain way, but when you go and observe it, it actually works in the opposite. And the the way that it actually works is the underlying assumption. So, well, mm-hmm. yeah, that's this is like pinging for me in my brain, especially because I'm so adjacent to the military where this is oh, very yes. obvious mm-hmm. that there mm-hmm. are definitely artifacts, that there are definitely beliefs and underlying underlying values that may actually be in contrast with the stated thing, you know. Yes. Mm-hmm. For example, if you ever get an email and it's the, the sign off is V slash R, you know it's a military person because you sign your emails very respectfully. <laughs> no, all the best. No, sincerely yours. It's very respectfully. Yeah. Or, for example, overhearing a conversation where one, you know, a senior officer says to a junior officer, it's okay, you don't have to call me sir all the time. And the junior officer says, thanks very much, sir. I really appreciate that. (laughs) You know, but there's this, okay, the stated thing, but then the underlying assumption is this is the way we do it. And I'm going to stick with that. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, yeah, yeah, definitely picking up this whole company culture thing. Yeah. And so in a church, like if some of those underlying assumptions are going to be like where you actually stand and sit during a service, (laughs) what it actually says in the hymnal, which responses you sing or say, regardless of what it says in the hymnal, like those kinds of things of just of how a group of people act together. And it's just understood by everybody. Mm -hmm. So that that's kind of the basis of culture. So macro cultures are the the big overarching cultures that affect all of the cultures underneath. So take the ladies' lounge, for example. We are influenced by Midwestern culture, Lutheran culture, probably some German culture since our church body is German. And some Scandinavian culture, and too. Some Scandinavian culture, too. That is very true. LCMS corporate culture since we run it out of corporate LCMS, right? KFUO Radio corporate culture, since it's a production of KFUO Radio, it's influenced by those things as well. All of those, lart hitting my mic, I'm so excited. All of those, those bigger cultures that influence the smaller culture of the thing underneath. So think about all of those, the underlying assumptions that come along with each of those different cultures. And Midwest culture, I know is a big thing. There's a whole Midwest versus everybody Facebook slash Instagram social media presence because all of those, all of the the ways that Midwest culture reacts to things like the Midwest goodbye and like how winter is such a thing for Midwest people and you wear shorts and sweatshirts until it's like 30 degrees. Like all of those things are part of a, of a Midwest macro culture. And if you're a Midwesterner and you move somewhere else in the country and you act like a Midwesterner, people are going to know that you're a Midwesterner because of those bigger mac- macro culture things. Oh, yeah. Midwest goodbyes don't fly in Connecticut. (laughs) Right. There's all of these different aspects that play into how each of us acts within each other and and also how we view each other. Because we're a group, just taking the lounge, for example, we're a group that is comprised of people from around the United States and around the world. And so that affects 
how we interact in the lounge, like virtually, but also if like when you go to conferences and you meet people from different parts of the country, how you interact with people is affected by those those bigger cultural influences that just we act the way that we act because of those cultural influences on top of us. Right. And so that's where this applies to anybody in any relationship. So because we're in relationship with other people who are different from us, especially if we are transplants from our original place where we, like I grew up in Michigan and now I live in St. Louis, two different cultures in those different cities. Michigan is very Midwest culture. St. Louis is South Midwest, depending on who you ask, but that also (laughs) that blend of Midwest and Southern culture in St. Louis is a whole thing as well. We have to get along with, well, we don't, I guess we don't have to, we should want to get along with the people around us. And so we talk about empathy a lot, seeing things from another person's perspective. And so this is a very concrete way to do that, to have empathy for somebody else's perspective. If you're talking with someone and you're like, how they're responding to me isn't driving with how I think they should responding to me. Maybe I should take a step back and think about where they're coming from for a second. And so... Mm. We can consider those macro cultures when when there's a rub, when there's conflict Mm. in how we're having a relationship with someone. Take, for instance, somebody from the Pacific Northwest. They're going to have a very Pacific Northwest culture when they're talking with people. Right. Can I tell you a story? How I did and I would come from the Midwest and I did an internship in a newspaper when I was in college out in Eastern Oregon, where my husband's family are from. Mm. And I took out all my business casual clothes, right? And I show up the first day in a skirt and a blouse and, you know, some dressy sandals. And I look around the newsroom and this at this small town newspaper, everybody, jeans and sneakers. And I was like, <laughs> shoot, I only brought one pair of jeans for the whole summer. Yeah. How am I going to work this? Because the culture was just so much more casual mm-hmm. and relaxed than I was used to, you know, a a business Mm -hmm. environment. Anyway, so yeah, go on with your Pacific Northwest example, unless that actually covers it. (laughs) I mean, that that is kind of the point. When you go into a different culture, it's going to be different. And understanding that instead of being offended by it and be like, why don't people act like I do? It's because they're in a different culture. So somebody from the Pacific Northwest, they may approach conversations more bluntly. They may not mince words. I guess I suppose this works in other parts of the country too. A non-Midwesterner tends to be more blunt, oh, yeah. not the Midwest nice of not offending people, right? And then you have a Midwesterner who doesn't want to offend, is going to say yes to everything and then maybe talk about you behind your back. And they're, you're trying to have a conversation and in this mentality... And you may end up not understanding what the other person is saying. The Midwesterner may think that the Pacific Northwesterner is just being mean and cruel because they're saying things very bluntly when they're they're not. They're just they're acting in their culture of just speaking things very bluntly. And, and they're not trying to offend you. They're actually trying to be nice to you by telling you the truth right off the bat. And that may not come across as nice. Oh, yeah. No, <laughs> Ken and I, my husband, of course, is from Oregon. Yeah. And yeah, that was a conversation we had early on in our marriage. He would say, if you want me to wash the dishes, just say, Ken, wash the dishes. Not, hey, Ken, if you're not too busy today, it'd be really great if, well, would you mind maybe thinking about washing the dishes at some point today? That drove him up the wall. <laughs> and I'd be like, this is how my people communicate. So, yeah. Yeah. Precise. We've adjusted. Yeah. So, I mean, this happens a lot in marriage, especially if you marry from two different parts of the country. And just understanding that as you approach conversations and relationships, whether you know each other really well or not, having that that mindset of this person, if they love me and if they're for me, we talked about that last time, mm-hmm. and they have my best interests in mind, I probably should have a positive regard of what they're, what they're trying to do in this relationship and not I just automatically assume that they're being mean because they're telling me very bluntly what to do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's, that is macro cultures at a very high level. I feel like all the examples you gave are all examples of subcultures and microcultures. <laughs> I feel like <laughs> macro cultures, you never got even as far as American culture. I mean, like, like 
you have all of these examples of small, small, small cultures. These are all tiny subsets. Some of them are larger, medium, but uh, maybe I didn't give all great examples. Small, <laughs> small examples. So you're thinking like Western culture. culture. That would be a macro culture. Oh, yeah. I'm okay. So, yes, America. American culture, definitely a macro culture. Midwestern culture. So it, it all kind of funnels down. So I'm thinking of it as a perspective of me uh-huh. as being the smallest culture. And then what are all the umbrella layers above me that are the, so the bigger cultures that are affecting What you're proposing is that each individual person has a culture of themselves is yes. the most essential culture. Yeah. And then everything outside of that is a macro culture. Of some level. Oh, that's okay. how I'm understanding okay. it anyway. Yeah. Just want to understand where you're, what you're speaking to. Okay. <laughs> I gotcha. So every individual person is a culture of one. Yes. Can okay. I just say my culture is awesome. I don't want to be like <laughs> set up any sort of cultural hegemony, but yeah, it's pretty cool. Y'all should come be part of my culture. <laughs> So there may be other ways to to view this, but yeah, that's the way that I okay. I was viewing mm-hmm. it is that coming from my own perspective or even a company or a church being the smallest culture that you're going to consider and then everything above that those mm. umbrellas those concentric circles going out those are all of the the bigger cultures that are affecting that one entity as macro cultures. Mm-hmm. Okay. Great question, yeah. Aaron. Yeah. I didn't even think of that until you said it and then I'm like that is you're right. This is what Aaron's good at. Aaron's all about those Q3, the Q4 questions. relational nutrients, man. I told you, Aaron. Aaron's my person that I wasn't kidding. When I say something and Aaron's like, wait a second, you don't make any sense. It's great. I understand you now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for clarifying. <laughs> All right, moving on. Let's see what, what Aaron's going to clarify on this one. <laughs> okay, but I, I wanted to talk about that because that also plays into the next part, which is personal mission, vision, and values. And I'm going to be honest, when when I saw that we were going to have to do this in one of my classes, I was like, I don't know how I feel about this. This feels a little weird to me. I don't know that I want, like, what what is a personal mission and vision and values? This feels kind of mm. hokey. But <laughs> it was very, very useful. So... I, I want to frame this in a perspective of vocation because that is what ended up being really clarifying for me when talking about a personal mission, vision, and values. Now, I had to do this for a class, so mm-hmm. I had a very specific structure for how I had to do this so I could turn my assignment in the way that my professor wanted it. Y'all don't necessarily have to go that far at all, but I think it is a very helpful practice to think through a personal mission and vision and values just for clarifying your vocations, discerning the vocations that you have and how God is preparing you to serve. And that gives you a lot more permission to set boundaries, to say no to things that don't actually align with Mm. your gifts and how you should or could be using your time to serve in the best way possible. A lot of us Midwest culture like to say yes to everything or feel really bad when we say no to doing stuff when people ask us to do things. And we don't necessarily have to do everything that everybody asks us or all the opportunities that we're like, oh, this would be really fun to do. But then you're flat out exhausted and you can't serve your family in the way that you should. So like just considering this in in light of the vocations that you have and how you're actually being called to serve is really, really helpful. At least for me, it was. I think it will be for a lot of other people. So I had to do this uh, partly because doing this with an organization is kind of critical to a business. And so it made sense for us to go through the process for ourselves as well as part of like discerning our leadership styles. So for everybody else, it's it's really helpful to understand your strengths, how God is leading you in service and service to your neighbor. And so your personal values are the things that are really at your core. So these are like the five to 10 things that shape how you act and think and make decisions. Some people might be like, I have like 20 of those, but it's really helpful to narrow them down as as much as you can. I was one of those people. It's helpful to narrow them down as much as you can because it's really the core, core things of how you function, how you make decisions, how you act, how you think, just like how you function as a person. And so there's lists online of like value words that you can pick from. A lot of people are like, you shouldn't look at those. You should Mm. just come up with them in your own head. But if you're not somebody that's great at coming up with those things in your own head, 
there are lists online and you can like pick the ones that resonate the most with you or whatever. You want to determine what drives you forward, what shapes your actions to other people, what shapes your decisions about how to spend your time. Thinking about those vocations that you have, like when I get up in the morning, what is pushing me forward? How do I determine how I'm going to spend my time or what's most important to me? If I have an hour of free time, what are my determining factors for what I'm going to do with that time? How do I interact with my husband? How do I have a relationship with my parents or my brothers? What is most important to me when I come to my job? What shapes how I'm going to function Mm -hmm. in that space? How changeable are these? Like, are these things that like once you are an adult, these are pretty much this is who you are and they aren't changeable are they i mean i don't think so these probably shouldn't be something that you're changing every year okay i think it's something that through every season of your life is probably going to be pretty consistent and i know that's even am- ambiguous of like what is a season in your life but like well, a, yeah. a year ago they would have been different for me because i wasn't in grad school like i was in a different place in my life mm-hmm. a year ago and 3 years before that pre pand three years, four years ago, pre-pandemic may have been different then Mm. too. So the general practice and stuff like this is like when you review, if you have like a growth plan or like, I shouldn't say that with a snarky attitude, if you have a growth plan or if you have like every year, if you make goals for yourself, it's just helpful to review them and see if if you're still on track with like, all of this is still tracking. When your vocations change, if you become a mother, if you get married, if you have if grand- your last homeschool child graduates, because right. mm, that yes. is something I have some friends who are going through this year. Yeah. And it just it changes how you spend your time and what your daily values look like. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So like when big life changes happen, any of those times, they wouldn't necessarily change, but I wouldn't be surprised at those changes in seasons of your life that that things could change because your vocations will be different. I think probably what's more likely is that they would reorder, you know, say Mm -hmm. like right now, my kids are a huge priority and my parents are a lower priority. Mm -hmm. However, there will probably come a season a few years down the road that I still, Mm -hmm. you know, kids and parents are still high priorities for me. But it may be that my kids are all self-sufficient and my parents are aging and need my care in a different way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so those values might shift. Yeah. yeah, that's quite possible. Mine right now, I mean, there's, and I'm going to tell you what mine are. There's okay. a few of them that have been true for me probably since I was a kid. Like okay. some of them just have not changed because they are at the essence of who I am as God has made me, right? Mm-hmm. There's some other ones that have shifted just because now I'm an adult and now I have a job and a husband and a house and a car, like all of these other things that are just more things that I have to deal with as an adult. So my values are Christ, good number one, Christ Mm -hmm. at the center, live according to his commandments. So that's like number one overarching thing that drives absolutely everything I do, right? I'm a baptized child of God. I live as a Christian, as a Lutheran, like that is, if I only had one, that would be it. And then I have excellence. So I strive for excellence in all things not perfection, excellence. (laughs) (laughs) That is different than it may have been five years ago. (laughs) Compassion. So living with a stance of empathy, justice, honesty, loyalty, and dignity in in all of my relationships. So that is something that has been pretty core to me for a really long time, but it has honed in on itself as I've done a lot more studying and a lot more self reflection on like who I actually want to be as a person, right? Mm. Possibility. So continually curious and creative, seeking adventure and innovation in all of my experiences. That one hasn't changed very much in a long time (laughs) because I love being curious about stuff. Delight. This one may be my favorite one, though. Seeking beauty and joy with an attitude of humor, whimsy and wit. (laughs) Wait a minute. Well, in itself. Whimsy has an H. Wit yeah, does wit not does have not. an H. <laughs> okay. <laughs> wit. That's the opposite so of boring. <laughs> oh, whimsy, Rachel. <laughs> wit so is taking whimsy. the whimsy out of the wit. <laughs> what are we even talking about? <laughs> I love that one. Stewardship. Caring for my body and soul created things and nature as gifts from God. So this is my first article gifts one. I'm really big on first article gifts. Enjoying the things that God has given us to enjoy in our lives. And then my last one is uncommon. Embracing my weird self and enjoying my unique abilities to serve. That one I have had to grow into. 
because I'll, for a very, very long time, I just thought I was a weird person and I didn't fit in any, anywhere. And then during residency, all of my fellow people were like, Sarah, you are a weird person, but that's what makes you you. Like, you, that, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh. <laughs> so this is a new one. So that's a fairly, that is one that that I have now embraced. You're, yes. you're seeking to make this one of your primary values. Like yeah. You're, you're intending to grow into like fully endorsing this. Yeah. I don't have to act. Like, I mean, okay. I still need to be a respectful yeah. like Christian adult, right? But like <laughs> the things that I feel like are weird, like that's okay. Uh -huh. That's how God mm -hmm. made me to be. Uh -huh. So okay. I should okay. not reject those I things see. and yeah. rejecting how yeah. God made me, but being okay with the fact that I just do stuff a little differently than other uh -huh. people. And that's okay. So so those are, are my my current values, the things that my actions and decisions boil down to. So okay. if you do any of the things that I'm talking about, values are probably, it's the lowest hanging fruit. You can probably think of a few things in general categories mm -hmm. that are most important to you and really drive how you live and how you interact with people. So if you do any of it, that would be the one that I would suggest doing. So then a mission statement is... A statement that really ties these values together, it tells what's most important to you and what you want to accomplish. And so that sounds super businessy, right? Like I'm going mm, to accomplish these results. Mm -hmm. But results and like accomplishing things, you can have goals in any vocation that you have. Goals as a mom are going to, they're going to look different than like my goals at work, but they're still goals. They're still mm -hmm. things that you're striving to do. And so this is applicable in any of those places as well. So thinking about your future, thinking ahead, how you want to serve your neighbors around you most effectively. What do you actually want to do? How do you want to serve? Where do you see God doing those things in your life? So yes, it's very businessy, but it doesn't have to be. Mm. You can make this work in a family setting as well. So this is by the way, this is super vulnerable for me because I'm like putting my mission and vision and values out there into the world right now. It's just sitting at my desk and nobody can see them except me and everyone that comes in. But now they're on a podcast. It's really scary. So <laughs> I wasn't going to say anything, but I was I was thinking to myself, wow, this is super brave of you, Sarah. I have these things, probably some version of them, but... I don't know if I want to say them out loud. Yes, I'm, uh -huh. I'm acknowledging that I'm being very vulnerable right now, guys. Uh -huh. <laughs> We're acknowledging that you're being brave. Thanks, guys. <laughs> okay. Oh, I had to say that before I do my mission and vision. So my mission statement is <laughs> to use my unique God-given talents, abilities, and personalities to love God and serve my neighbor, uplifting women and girls to know their worth as children of God. That is something that has been influenced heavily by our work in the ladies lounge over the last hmm. few years and maybe what will come in the future, you know, as I do more schooling and stuff. So that is definitely something that is different than I would have had four years ago, hmm. which I think is cool. That is. So for me and my vocations, the most important thing for me is making sure that people know that they're loved by me. Like I know those Q1, like getting in the well, making sure people know that they're loved. That stuff is really important to me making sure people know that they, that I love them and that God also loves them through Jesus mm -hmm. Christ. Right? Do I do this perfectly? Absolutely not. <laughs> so like that's that's like the refocusing all the time on how is God using me to serve my neighbor, refocusing on that. So this is like in the back of my head as I make decisions about how I move forward into, you know, career no, I'm not leaving here. Don't worry. I'm like, <laughs> thinking 20 or 30 years down the line, I mean, who knows what God has in store for me? But but thinking about those opportunities, the possibilities, what I do if I if I do more education, how I'm serving in my church, how I'm volunteering my time, that kind of stuff too. So the vision statement then is how you want others to view you and what you ideally see in your future as your goal. And so the idea mm. is that if you work your mission and values consistently you'll achieve your vision. Also sounds super businessy, but the same the same thing applies. So for a stay-at-home mom, this could be something as simple as like, I want my children to see me as a godly example of how an adult behaves and to raise them in the faith so they love Jesus and serve others in their future vocations. Like that is an amazing vision statement for a mom. Or I mean, same thing goes for, for dads or for, you know, if you're not married yet, if you're a college student, like you can have these, these vision, overarching vision and mission statements that they will eventually change. If you, if you get to that point where you've, you've completed that, maybe you, then you'll have another one, but this kind of applies regardless of your situation. And so 
my vision statement is to be seen by the Lutheran community as a life-affirming voice of women and girls, especially those who face this fallen world's mental, physical, and spiritual burdens. I will serve these women and girls with the love of Christ, uplift them in the promises of God, walk alongside them as a sister in Christ, be their safe space in times of strife, and provide practical and tangible support so that they in turn can confidently and graciously serve their neighbors in love. That's it. Like, that's what I'm working toward. It's Mm -hmm. not perfect. It's not maybe exactly what I'm doing right now, but that is where I see myself going in in all of these things. So as you consider your relationship with others and your different vocations, these values and these statements can really help clarify what you're doing and to manage the things that you you want to do for others. Setting boundaries on your time, what you say yes to, what you say no to. Maybe it's a self-reflection time where you're like, oh, I actually should be spending more of my time over here where I've been neglecting it. And I need to say no to these other things so I can serve in a better way. So yeah, that is personal mission and vision and values. Mm -hmm. That is a really great exercise. And I appreciate you finding the bravery to share examples of this. But obviously, Mm -hmm. you don't actually have to share them with anybody. Oh, this is something I didn't even know I was doing this, but I have regularly... Full disclosure, I'm like the world's worst diarist. I do not keep a diary or a journal. I've tried several times. I thought it would be cool to be somebody who kept a journal and I don't. But I do have a journal that I pull out during times of serious discernment about Mm -hmm. where I am and where I'm going in life. And Mm -hmm. so, you know, it might be once or twice a year I pull it out and do a lot of like just this kind of writing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Figuring out who am I? What do I value? What do I want, you know? How how do I want to spend my time, my money, my heart? And it's a really useful exercise. I'd never thought of it as making a personal mission statement, but that's exactly what I've been doing. And it is really helpful, yeah. really helpful, clarifying. Mm-hmm. So yeah. highly recommend this as a journaling activity, if nothing else. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. No, and I can see how it would be especially especially valuable in making decisions and I think especially in feeling feeling more confident and comfortable in the decision, like being able to mm. be like, yes, I'm confident in this decision. I know why I made it. It's because mm-hmm. this aligns with this thing that I value. This is one of the priorities that I have. This yeah. is something that I want to be striving towards or it's not. Yeah. And mm-hmm. not that it's a bad thing, right. but it doesn't align in that way. And allowing you to have have more of that be not just gut, mm. but actually thought through. Yeah. This is pulling stuff up from your gut into your head. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Because a lot of times, like when those big decisions hit of like, you could choose two pathways and either one of them are great and you pray about it. And you're like, I mm-hmm. need some wisdom, God. Mm-hmm. And you pray for wisdom yep. and you pick one of them and you move forward. And this this process can help clarify when those things happen because those mm-hmm. will happen. As, <laughs> as yeah. <laughs> For me, a really helpful paradigm shift is in moving away from right and wrong decisions. I mean, there are r- right and wrong exist. This isn't all relative, but oftentimes <laughs> right, in right. our lives, yeah. the decisions we face, it may not be that there's one yeah. right decision Yeah, towards thinking more about good and bad decisions. You know, if it's a decision that has been made thoughtfully and in alignment with my values, it might not work out the way I think it ought to. But I can still look back and say, based on what I knew at the time, that was a good decision. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But knowing your own values is essential to being able to make those kinds of choices. Yeah. Yep. All right. Okay. On to part three. And this is this was life changing for me, guys. So this is Dr. John Townsend's eight step model for difficult conversations. Oh, I, I, I just remembered. I have a thing. I have to go. I don't. I no. You're saying <laughs> I don't think I need this part of this conversation right now. I am 
terrible at difficult conversations, but I'm less terrible now because uh-huh. I know I I have a model for doing them and okay. I've used it a couple of times and there are a couple conversations that I need, not with either of you, but there's <laughs> a couple conversations that are on my growth plan for school uh-huh. that I need to have that I haven't had yet, but this is okay. the model I'm going to use. So okay. this is probably, I think, I mean, I'm only three classes in, so I may change my mind in a year, but this is probably one of the most significant things that's going to come out of this program for me, quite honestly, just because having hard conversations is hard and it Mm -hmm. probably will always be hard for me. It's hard for a lot of people. Like there's, there are some people that are just totally comfortable doing this and that's great. If this is your spiritual gift, more power to you. Maybe there's something you can still glean out of this and like a process of how to do it without making people angry or whatever. But for a lot of people, this is this is a really big area that we struggle with. Maybe, maybe especially in Midwest Lutheran culture, when we don't want to offend people, this is actually a way to have a hard conversation with someone without offending them. Hopefully, mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't know. I was going to say, can you guarantee that? <laughs> Not guarantee that, but it gives you maybe a, a more hope for <laughs> for being able to approach it in a way mm-hmm. that you can be more confident about what you have to say to somebody. Because hard conversations are, are pretty necessary for us to have in a lot of areas. And when you, because when you avoid stuff, it just gets worse, right? We've all been there. Mm-hmm. You're, you should have a conversation with someone. You don't. A year later, it's a way worse situation. Then you really don't want to have a conversation. Yeah. And then it just ends up being a whole thing. So, and yet in defense of those of us who like to avoid difficult conversations, there's a reason we're not insane. We have all witnessed situations where people we know and love have tried to have difficult conversations Mm -hmm. and it has ended up in a great big explosion that did not make things better that just made things worse and became a powder keg waiting for the next attempt at a difficult conversation so it could explode again i mean we we have all witnessed that kind of thing and it makes us say um yeah i'll wait Mm -hmm. it's okay yeah yeah because an explosive conversation is no more productive than an evasive conversation. Right. So I'm really eager to hear what Dr. Townsend has to say about how to avoid both of these scenarios and and (laughs) walk down the middle. Yeah. Yeah. The number one key is to tackle something before it becomes a big enough problem. But I know that's not a reality for a lot of situations. (laughs) (laughs) Sometimes things just get big fast. Yeah, that's true. They do. And... To be fair, this isn't a magic pill. Like you're not Mm going to like, it's not going to be magic, but it is a helpful model. If you know, like you really have to do it, but in your gut, you're like, I don't want to do it. This is helpful, Mm -hmm. especially to think through how to actually have the conversation first, instead of just like walking up to somebody and starting to talk because then it can go downhill very quickly. But if you actually have a plan for how you want to approach the situation, for me anyway, that does make it a lot easier because you have a plan. You're not just blindly going into a conversation. The rules apply also of like picking the right, t- this isn't part of the model, but like if you're hungry or tired or in a, like just physically in a bad place, don't, don't try. It's not, anger <laughs> is not a good, mm. not a good state to be in if you're trying to have a hard conversation. Like make sure you've had food and make sure you've had enough sleep and you're Maybe in the a, other person too. And the other, per- yes, that applies to both people. <laughs> don't ambush them. <laughs> Do when not they- ambush them <laughs> right. while they're hungry. This yeah. thing will not end well. <laughs> but like keeping those things in mind, mm-hmm. those are just general rules of when to talk to somebody about something you need to actually have a productive conversation. Make sure you've had food and sleep and you're physically in a comfortable space to have a conversation. So the premise of this is that the word confront in Latin actually means to turn toward and to engage and confrontation is a similar relational skill as love or vulnerability. And it's necessary in order to build up relationships. So if we think about confronting people in that same space of being vulnerable and loving the other person through wanting to solve this problem, having that mindset is helpful just to begin all of this. I feel like I am somewhat amused because, I mean, I could be wrong, but Yes, turn toward engage, but that's the same word we used for with the enemy. Like, yes, we're going. <laughs> yes, that's true. We're going to turn toward and engage the enemy. Like, I have, I, I get that. That's a nice positive twist. Now I'm looking nice forward to you, twist. like, giving me this whole new perspective of it. But I feel like the Latin root wasn't. I could be wrong, but I just don't feel like it was really about 
Yes, turning toward and engaged sounds really friendly, unless you're talking about armies. (laughs) <laughs> Which I think is that, that's what confront like and anyway, given the are. Latin the Latin macro culture was all about big <laughs> armies. I think it's a new perspective. We're giving this a it's nice a twist. new perspective on conf- <laughs> confrontation. And Confronta- this is good. Yes. Well, this is good. But it's not so. it's not like it's gonna be happy and pleasant either. I mm-hmm. mean, let's be honest about that. Loving people sometimes is very hard. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you mm-hmm. have this to is do- the moment. Yeah. When you stop running away. Yeah. Yeah. Like that, yeah. the opposite of confront right. is retreat. That's true. That's yeah. true. Right. So yes. walk us through what's, okay. what is this approach? Okay. So there's eight steps to this. A couple of them are optional. So the first part is, is the for you stance. So this is when you state to the other person that you are for them. We've talked about this a little bit before. When you want the person to know that you are doing this out of, respect or love or pick the right adjective depending on the situation. Like, mm. I don't know that you tell your coworker that you love them, but <laughs> if you're doing this like with your spouse, so like, I love you and I really appreciate how much you do for this family or I love you and I want the best for you or I really appreciate the the work that you do here and I know you put in a lot of time to get stuff done or, you know, pick pick the the sentence that is that works in your situation, but stating making it known to the other person that you're here out of a out of a place of love and concern and that you you recognize the work that the other person does and appreciate that. So that's where you start. Is that Something- the spoonful of sugar that makes the medicine go down? Yes it is. <laughs> <laughs> And something to remember is that a lot of times we we fragilize other people or we don't think that other people can handle the truth. And that's really easy to do. But people can handle truth, especially if it's safe for them to experience. And so you're trying to create this environment where they're not going to be super defensive right away. And they might mm. be. And we'll deal with that in a second. <laughs> but, but people can handle truth. You can't handle the truth. People can handle the truth if you're not like banging them over the head with a binder full of stuff that you want them to do. Like they can handle the truth. Mm-hmm. So number two, state the problem. Be specific. And this is where it's helpful to think through a conversation and to handle one thing at a time, Mm. especially in family issues. One thing turns into like 10 things and they're all kind of interrelated and you want to deal with all of them. But you want to be very specific about what the issue actually is that you want them to deal with. So state the problem. Don't state all the problems. Yes. (laughs) One at a time. Be specific. Try not to lump a bunch of things together. One thing at a time is really is really key for this. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, especially if you're dealing with somebody that like can't handle a lot of stuff all at once, like you're going to overwhelm them and then it's just going to implode. So one thing, be specific. Number three, own your own part. I think this is a unique part of this type of model. You're not just coming in and like completely blaming the other person. There's probably something that you could also be doing a little bit better, something that you haven't done or if you've sort of contributed to the problem. Maybe it's a very small thing, but you're giving some vulnerability of yourself as well. So you're leveling the moral playing field. Like, I mean, it could even be that I haven't told you this and I've because of that, it's gotten to be a bigger thing and I should have raised this sooner. Yes, that Uh. is absolutely a thing because, you know, I think my husband can read my mind and he totally can't. So there's a problem (laughs) that if I would have told him a year ago, it would be better by now. But because because I think he should read my mind, I haven't said it like that is absolutely a thing of like, this is on me for not bringing this up earlier or you know, there's something that I could have done better that would have affected you in a different way. Leveling that moral playing field, how you maybe contributed to it. It's okay to own that part of how you could have done better. A lot of times Mm -hmm. we're like, oh, if I admit my weakness, then it's not going to go as well. But it it helps to, to level that field and to not be completely blaming the other person for something that maybe you could have also Mm. done something differently that would have changed the outcome. Number four, hear their side and deal with diversion. So give them a chance to explain themselves, to defend themselves, to talk about why maybe they're acting in the way that they're acting or why they did what they did. You may learn something. Listen empathetically and let them talk because you want to hear them out and it's important to hear them out. And they may divert to other things, which is fine. Give them some time to vent. That's totally cool. The magic phrase for this when 
you start getting off into the weeds is let me get back to <laughs> whatever you were talking about. And that's what the you one say. problem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Let me get back to whatever the issue is at hand. Okay. And there is, this is where a caveat comes in. If they're just like going off into the weeds about stuff and you can reel them back into what you actually wanted to talk about, great. If they start attacking back or becoming incredibly defensive and you can tell that there's something else going on underneath, like something that's kind of related, but a different issue that you need to deal with, it is okay to drop what you were going to talk about Mm -hmm. right here and deal with that because there may be something underlying everything that you didn't know about that comes up here when they start explaining themselves. Hmm. And you may have to deal with that first so that you can eventually come back to this maybe later. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Number five, the request. So this is where you ask for a specific behavior change and you want to do your homework first to know specifically what change you want to ask for so that it's helpful, productive, something that's realistic. And this is going to be completely dependent on the issue that that you're bringing up. But you don't want to just be like wishy-washy of like, let's do better. Like you want to be specific of like, this is, this is what I, this is what I need from you. This is what I expect. You're bringing up a specific problem and then you're asking for a specific solution. Mm. That you actually have something that's actionable and feels reasonable that can be productive so that the conflict can actually be resolved at some point. And then six consequences if needed. This is one of the ones that like may or may not be appropriate depending on the relationship. <laughs> like, if you're a supervisor and you're talking to your direct report, consequences are, or you're a parent talking to a child or something where you actually have that power and authority in there, this would be appropriate, but... If you're talking to your boss, maybe, maybe not. Maybe not. <laughs> and, th- and you can do maybe this not. with your boss, but yes. I mean, you can do this, this whole model. You can manage up with this, but... Yeah, consequences for your boss, probably not appropriate. So this is one where you can take it or leave it depending on your situation. Well, the trouble with consequences, speaking as a parent, are if you lay out a consequence, which is usually an appropriate thing to do because they need to know the consequences, Mm -hmm. then you have to follow through. Yeah. Yeah. And if you don't, then the next time you try to have one of these hard conversations, it will mean nothing. Yeah. You know, so you got to be really careful. You know, you talk about specific problem and specific requests. You got to have specific consequences that are fully within your willingness and ability to follow through on. So if you're having this conversation with your boss and the consequences, if this doesn't change, I'm going to have to leave your employee. Yeah. Yeah. Then then you've got to be prepared if it doesn't change to leave. Yeah. And so it can be really dangerous in certain circumstances to threaten a consequence that you are not prepared to follow Mm -hmm. through on. Mm -hmm. Yes. This is why it's helpful to think through everything before you go into the situation. Because if you know what your consequence is going to be, you won't whiffle waffle on it. And it should be something that you're actually willing to follow through on if the behavior doesn't change. So yes, that's a very good point. So then number seven, we're coming back to the the four stance. So you're coming back to that, that positive regard reminding them that you're here for them, reminding them that this is out of a place of love and respect and you want the situation to get better. And this is very important because you've just done something that has probably affected them. I mean, this is this is not easy to do, right? So mm-hmm. you want you want to bring bring the conversation back into a space of of love and appreciation and remind them that like I I am here for you. I'm doing this because I want this to get better. And then step eight is checking back in a day later, 24 hours later. So a lot of times, I shouldn't say a lot of times, it's pretty common that we'll have a hard conversation and then we'll just like leave it and pretend it didn't happen or something, Mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. But you do actually want to check back in the next day and be like, hey, I, I know we had a hard conversation yesterday. We talked about a really hard thing. How are you doing? I just want to make sure that we're okay and that you still think it's reasonable or whatever whatever that conversation is, but checking back in with them, acknowledging that you both did a thing mm-hmm. and and that you you want to move forward with what you talked about. This seems to me to be a really essential part of the conversation, especially if you are in a relationship where one of you is a planner and the other is not. Yeah. For example, I could come into a hard conversation with an eight point strategy, probably a one page outline, <laughs> you know, 
with some a lot of research, I, I'll come in with data and statistics for why this is a this is a problem. And then the whole conversation, I've got the upper hand. Like I've planned for this. Hmm. I've got briefs, like a folder full of of information I can pull out to support my point. Whereas you never saw this coming and you're completely blindsided and you look like a deer in the headlights. So following up after you know, your conversation partner has had an opportunity to think through and process the conversation the day before, it's only fair. Like, I've had like six weeks to plan for this conversation. You didn't even know it was coming. Mm -hmm. So let's keep the conversation going now that you know this is a thing we need to talk about. Mm -hmm. And maybe you've got some insights today that you were not ready to share yesterday because you had never thought about it. Yeah, that's a really good point. That may or may not be an autobiographical anecdote. (laughs) (laughs) So like the whole point of this is just that we want to ultimately build up relationships and get and be be closer to people, whether it's at work or home or at church or something. And when hard stuff comes up or when, when there is conflict that we have to deal with, having the confidence to actually have those conversations before things fester and metastasize and become horrible things, if we have the confidence and the ability to handle it in an appropriate manner early enough when it's a problem, in the long run, it's going to be a better, hopefully a better outcome mm. if it's successful, right? So building up a culture of, of healthy confrontation means that people can live more in truth with each other instead of avoiding the truth. Because I think we talked about this last time too, that facing the reality of Mm. of what you're dealing with Mm -hmm. and facing the reality and the truth head on is going to be way better for you in the long run, even if it's hard reality and hard truth, Mm -hmm. facing that immediately and then being able to move through it together, like collectively is really, really healthy for a relationship so that things don't kind of implode. And we talked about the grace and truth over time thing. This is part of that, you know, this is grace and truth. Mm -hmm. And it may last over a while if if you have to keep revisiting it or you you have to to deal with things over time. So that's the conflict resolution model. So that's all I have for you guys. Have any any follow-up questions, any hard-hitting things you want to know about? So I'm curious with that, is that something that you like is it good to practice it? Sure. Like not even like not not like practice as in this is how I live my life. I practice this. <laughs> but like actually do test runs. Yeah. We call that role playing and you should absolutely oh, do it. Okay. Mm-hmm. We had to role okay. play this a little bit in one of our classes. But yeah. Yeah, you could over coffee one day with a friend and be like, mm-hmm. "Hey, I'm going to practice having a hard conversation and this is this is the character I mm-hmm. need you to play in my mm-hmm. life and I'm going to confront you about something." And you can even use real problems like if there's something you know you need to do and you can't quite do it yet, you can ask a friend, maybe not give away all your details yeah, for, yeah, you know, confidentiality. Probably depends on the problem, yeah. Probably depends on still. the problem. But, or you can role play something similar mm-hmm. to just give you the confidence of mm-hmm. being able to do it. And role playing can be uncomfortable. I get it. I've had to, I have to, I'm going to have to do a lot of role playing in this, <laughs> in this degree. And that's one of the things that every professor at Townsend will, be, will say that sets this degree apart from mm. a lot of others is that we role play a lot of stuff so that mm. it gets in your body in your in your brain that so that's comfortable when you actually have to do it but yeah okay. absolutely okay so my question is what counts as a difficult conversation and is there a limit on how many difficult conversations you should have going on at any one time because it seems like I could have a lot of difficult conversations with a lot of different people to the point that when they saw me coming <laughs> and be like oh here comes another difficult conversation. Every you know, time like, I'm hey, con- honey, we need a, co- a difficult conversation about the fact that you don't do the dishes. Hey, honey, we need another difficult conversation about the fact that you don't take out the trash. My husband does both of these things, by the way. No, but, what you value. Yeah, so it's going to be every time you tell them, hi, honey, I love you, they're going to brace. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's probably a bad precedent to set. <laughs> So, but I guess the I guess the old maxim pick pick your battles applies yeah. here. That if there is something yeah. maybe that is really getting in the way of your relationships and your yeah. long term quality of life, then you know have that difficult conversation. But if yeah. it's something that you just like want to be honest with for the sake of being honest with, but you were honest about something else yesterday mm-hmm. and it's getting old, yeah. you know yeah. maybe maybe not. I don't know. Yeah. 
This is I mean, this is thorny. Like, because once you get started yeah. having these difficult conversations, <laughs> it seems to me like they could come out really fast and furious for a while. I mean, I, I, I suspect and that if you do that often enough with one person, they will learn this model and will start having them with you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, my... <laughs> No, I observe how this works. Okay, Rachel, it's my turn I, uh, now. I, I love what you do here, but we got to talk. <laughs> <laughs> I think my threshold for when I would need to do something of this level is if I think about a situation I'm having with a person that's kind of been ongoing and it makes me kind of queasy to think about it, mm. this is probably what I need to do. Uh, if okay. it's just like... Like okay. you need to remind somebody to do something mm-hmm. like that's not a, that's not this. This mm-hmm. is for like you're, you got to prepare yourself to actually bring up something big and probably mm-hmm. hard. And maybe that they're going to be like, oh, I didn't know I was doing that. The, those kind of like gut level conversations of things you got to handle. Mm-hmm. Does it need that to be something sense. that they are actually able to change? Because, all right, say, for example, my problem with some nameless person is a deep character attribute, like, say, a short temper, you know? And my hard conversation is, I really need you to have not so short a temper. And maybe they say, well, I would like to have not so short a temper, too. I don't know how to fix this. That's when you tell them to go to Mm. therapy. (laughs) In a nice way. (laughs) So, you know, it's like this is... You you need therapy. (laughs) It seems to me like this model of difficult conversation is would be more useful for something that was a discrete changeable situation well, I mean, that rather is than a deep be, personality conflict. Yeah. I mean, as far as the request go, I mean, it needs to be a specific behavior change. Just telling them I need you to not have a short temper is yeah. not a specific that's behavior. Not, like well, that's not specific I, enough. If And, and I know we're going to dig deep into this one example, but if someone has a short temper like that, I would wonder what's triggering it. And maybe that's the thing you have to talk about. Oh. There may be something going on underneath that if you observe a little bit more, like what's triggering this person Mm -hmm. to have an issue, Mm -hmm. maybe there's something else you actually have to deal with. I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Not a psychologist. (laughs) Okay. So make, but make sure that you use this model primarily for things where you have a specific problem that has a specific solution. Yeah. If you're going to bring up a problem to somebody and there's no way to fix it, that's going to be really, really challenging. Just spin on your wheels. I don't know that that would be this kind of like, I, I was kind of kidding about the therapy, but I mean, in that kind of situation where it's like, where it's an ongoing conflict of something that mm-hmm. you don't know that is going to change, like that is actually some time that you probably should either you get therapy or the other person get therapy so mm-hmm. you can work through that because that's a, that's like a big, big mm-hmm. issue mm-hmm. that you probably can't fix and the other person probably needs some help to fix. So right. that's, that's like a different category of, of difficultness in my personal view of what I know about things. So... Yeah. So the Coming problem next time. I don't like you. That's <laughs> not, <laughs> not a problem that is, you know, that's not a conversation. Yeah. Start from that's, actually liking the person. Yeah. yeah. The, oh, you are so very cool. unlikable is yeah. not a problem. <laughs> yeah. Okay. 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 But yes, next time on Sarah goes to school, Dr. Townsend's yeah. 20 point model for really, really <laughs> difficult conversation. <laughs> Oh, next time we get to talk about like dysfunctions of a teen. So that'll be fun. Mm. (laughs) And there's more. Can we talk about difficult conversations some more, Sarah? (laughs) I mean, the the other title of this class is conflict management. So Mm. it's funny how much leadership is about just managing conflict. It's Mm -hmm. what I'm learning right now. Yeah, I feel like leaders aren't surprised by that. No. (laughs) Well, because when stuff is going well. You're growing into your leader role and it's becoming more clear. I just, I gotta, (laughs) I gotta deal with more conflict, guys. So, yeah. Okay. That's all I have today, guys. This has been super fun. I hope you learned something that was helpful. I did, I did. Cool, cool, cool. And there is actually the model, if you, sorry, I should have said this. I don't know that anybody would be furiously scribbling notes, but if you did, I'm sorry, this, this is available online I should have said that but (laughs) sorry the eight step model is available online and we'll link that in the show notes so you guys can like print it off and put Mm. it on your fridge or something (laughs) that's a subtle hint to somebody in your house (laughs) that paper shows up on the fridge you know (laughs) or better yet bring copies for everyone to your next difficult conversation hi guys this is the outline we'll be following today (laughs) 
like an agenda for our meeting. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we will, we will share that. So stay tuned for the next episode of Sarah Goes to School. You can find all of our episodes, including everything else that we do on this podcast, all like over 200 episodes of them on our, no, on kfuo.org slash literally slash let's say, let's say our, places, our app, fair. but we don't have an app. It's KFUO's app. You can go to KFUO's app as well or on any podcast app that you use. You can find all of our episodes there. You can leave me some feedback, some comments, comments on this episode in our Facebook group as well. If you have questions or other things that you want me to talk about or research or whatever, you can do that in our Facebook group, the Lutheran Ladies Lounge on Facebook and also on our Instagram page at Lutheran Ladies Lounge. You can sign up for our e-newsletter by sending us an email, lutheranladies at kfuo.org. You're listening to the Lutheran Ladies Lounge podcast. I'm Sarah. I'm Erin. And I'm going to go have some difficult conversations. I thought you were going to do your 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 school dis like class dismissed. Class dismissed. There we go. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> <laughs>and opinions expressed on the Lutheran Ladies Lounge podcast may not represent the official position of the management or ownership of KFUO Radio, the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. The Lutheran Ladies Lounge is produced by KFUO Radio and available at kfuo.org or wherever you get your podcasts. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button and leave a review for us too. If you love the Lutheran Ladies Lounge podcast, consider financially supporting our producer, KFUO Radio, so we can keep doing what we do. Find out how at kfuo.org slash give.